Hello and welcome to session five. Today we're going to be talking about minority issues in policing. The first chapter is by Friedel and Scott and this di discusses the complexity and challenges that are involved with the issue of racially biased policing. Um, the authors emphasize first and foremost that racial profiling is not a new phenomenon. Of equal importance, uh, we should understand that the term itself racial profiling is not uniformly accepted by many experts in the field and the term is thought to be by many to be too vague and unable to fully encompass the full concerns of both police officials and citizens alike. Uh, there are many reasons why police officers are better situated today to address these issues unlike other times in the past. Uh, one characteristic that the authors identify is that we are in a new era of policing. Um, and this could include having new tools and skills for dealing with these very complex and sensitive issues like racial profiling. Also, the authors discuss that today there are an abundance of progressive police chiefs and sheriffs across the nation and they might be more willing than ever before to discuss and acknowledge the problems of racial profiling have an, and have an honest to goodness conversation about it. Uh, these leaders understand that the, implement, excuse me, that the implementation of initiatives designed to address racial profiling not only aid in addressing the issue but it will also create a positive perception for police agencies, which is always important, uh, especially if you are in a pointed uh, position where uh, the public really does play a role in you continuing to get appointed uh, or elected for that matter. Uh, and so law enforcement agencies are also bringing in outside experts, um, such as research groups, perhaps professors in certain areas, in order to help analyze the effectiveness of new initiatives. And uh, these various elements seem to be the necessary steps in order to bring about real change in police agencies across the nation. Um, and I think the officer, authors do a very good job of uh, breaking down some of the important issues uh, when you're talking about racially biased policing. Um, as you can see, I have a picture of Dirty Harry. Um, not to say that he was racially biased, uh, although he did make racial statements in some of his movies. That's a fictitious character, obviously. There are some things you should know. Um, how can police bias be reduced? according to the authors, and uh, consider issues related to education against bias policing, um, training issues and so forth, and uh, then also can community outreach programs play any role uh, when it comes to uh, racially biased policing. So those are a few of the issues that you may want to consider. Now let's go ahead and turn our attention to an Afrocentric perspective on policing by Christopher Cooper. And this focuses on the perspective of black and other minority populations. And he coins this term the Afrocentric perspective. Um, the author states that many police administrators will sometimes make blanket statements that their officers don't engage in racial profiling or they wouldn't behave in a racially discriminatory manner. However, police administrators do not know what all officers are doing during the course of their eight-hour shifts. And it's important to understand that discrimination can happen with even the least expected officers anywhere, anytime, according to uh, the author. Um, the author also, I think, brings up an interesting point when he stated that policing is simply one of the many microcosms of life. Um, and what he means by this is that in real life there is racism and there's no reason to believe that because there's racism in society that there wouldn't be racism in policing because police officers first and foremost are human beings and 
they're human beings first and officers second. Therefore, the personal biases and beliefs and ideals, if you will, of the police officers will be apparent in their department. And it's difficult to leave those preconceived notions at home. And no matter how hard officers try, sometimes those beliefs are going to enter into the policing profession when they put on their gun and their badge and go to work. And the reality of the Afrocentric perspective is clearly validated, and it should be acknowledged, according to Cooper, by all of those working in the policing world and as, uh, by society as a whole. Some key aspects to consider, um, look at the demographics of those who study and write about police. Um, who do they tend to be? And why is this significant? Also, what was the purpose of early policing in the U.S. according to the author? You might be surprised about that as you look into this historical perspective that he gives. Um, other issues I have laid out, those are all equally important for this chapter. Um, I think the author writes a very compelling chapter, and I know many of you have read on this subject before. The next chapter um, is uh, chapter 21, and this article is written by a retired police executive uh, who's a female. And she writes that although there are increasing numbers of females who hold entry-level and mid-manager positions, uh, these are really uh, insufficient numbers. And she argues that you're more likely to see um, a higher percentage of female officers in metropolitan counties that are clearly urban. Uh, but if you start to look at suburban areas and especially rural non-metropolitan counties you tend to see that there is less and less females that are represented and that's sort of an important trend that she points out very well um, she argues that law enforcement remains a highly masculine profession um, and she looks at two theories one of which is the capital excuse me the human capital theory which argues that individuals make choices regarding whether they want to invest more time, effort, and money in education, training, and so forth in order to make themselves valuable to their organization. And she argues that this theory does not take into account a woman's choices regarding her maternal responsibilities and that many view women as not being as dedicated to their law enforcement careers as men. Uh, most female officers would like, likely argue uh, that statement. And then another obstacle that women must overcome is the issue of the homosocial repro reproduction. Um, this was a very interesting uh, part of her argument. I'm not going to get into it here, but I would encourage you to read that, uh, and it may be something that we might be discussing um, in the next day or so. Um, so it was a very very uh, well written article I thought she also refers to a study which she did in 2008 know about that study why do you think she limited why do you think that she uh, started mainly with sergeants uh, also what's meant by the term pink ghetto um, she also alludes to the Pittsburgh Police Department at a point in its history and that's worth reading I think too so a lot of things to like in that article uh, points out a lot of really important issues. Um, the final um, article is one that I selected from the archives, and it's, I think, a very interesting read. It's Diversity in Blue, Lesbian and Gay Police Officers in a Masculine Occupation. And in this article, um, the authors explore strategies that gay and lesbians will use to um, kind of navigate their way through these male-dominated heterosexual departments. While I really like this article, one thing to consider is that it is a little bit, uh, the literature review at least is a little bit outdated. They mention in the introduction that 24 states uh, criminalize homosexual behaviors, and that is no longer true. The case Lawrence versus Texas, which actually came out the same year as the article, uh, overturned any type of attempt for a state to criminalize homosexual behaviors. Um, 
And so that's sort of something to think about. Many interesting findings in this article, and I'm going to let you read over some of these at your leisure. Um, they found a difference between closeted and open uh, gay and lesbian officers. They also found that race played uh, an important, um, it was an important variable as to whether or not an officer would stay in the closet or whether or not he or she would be open. And then they found that lesbian officers suggested they had a common bond with heterosexual uh, female officers in combating sexism. So in the case for some lesbian employees, sexism played more of a role than um, heterosexism, if you will. And so that's just another important finding to think about. Um, and also as far as promotional opportunities and whether or not gay and lesbian officers believe this had any impact on their climbing up the hierarchy, there was considerable variation. Some respondents actually thought that for political reasons they might benefit uh, by virtue of being an out uh, employee. And there is a caveat of this study. Well, there are many. One of them is that this is a very, very small sample. Nevertheless, this study does give some interesting insights that have not been frequently examined in the literature. I have a few things that you should know. I've discussed those already, but I would certainly know maybe the difference is between being a gay versus lesbian officer, as well as between being an out of the closet versus a closeted officer and maybe some of the different decisions as to when an officer will go out of the closet. If you, as always if you have any questions feel free to email me and I look forward to interacting with everyone online. Have a great day.